Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters, and thank you very much for joining us in this video. We pray that you and your families are well, and we hope that you are uh, encouraged and inspired to continue in this uh, walk of faith. We, we know and we are not uh, ignorant of the fact that sometimes things are discouraging and sometimes you are faced with a bunch of questions of, of what's going to happen now or how we're going to do this or how we're going to do that. But I want to just take the moment for a few seconds to encourage you to continue on and know that the word of God is true, that the Lord will not uh, forget your labor and the things that you do towards his uh, name. So he's going to reward us. He's going to reward you for all that you you are doing and the things that you are uh, doing to publicize the testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's look at a passage here, John chapter 17. And I don't know that I'm going to read a focus text or like I normally do. Um, I really just want to consider this prayer. Um, many times we study prayers of individuals in the Bible. Uh, we talk about how to pray. But I want you to kind of consider probably, and I would be moved to say definitely the, the greatest prayer that has ever been prayed is in John chapter 17. Here in this text, we find not only how to pray, but we get a glimpse into you know, what God wants. Now, on one occasion, Paul says, we don't know what to pray for. Uh, we don't know what to pray for. The spirit of the Lord makes intercession for us so that we pray what we uh, what we would not pray. Uh, we have the ability to now finally pray the will of God, not because we have become so cognitive of what God wants, but more so because the spirit intercedes for us and helps us in the way that we are uh, filled and, and vexed with infirmities. So we understand that aspect of it. But but when it comes to Jesus, Jesus would have absolutely prayed everything within the will of the father. Uh, for instance, whenever he was on the cross or excuse me, whenever he's preparing to go to the cross, he prayed in the garden, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. So here it is. We understand that Jesus never prayed anything outside of the will of the Lord. So we look at this extensive account of a prayer that Jesus gave. It is uh, worth considering. So I want us to point out a few things that are important. The first thing is that in verse one through verse number four, Jesus reveals that he was ultimately concerned with bringing glory to the father. In fact, all of his his entire existence, his ministry was geared towards making sure the father was known and making sure that people understood that he, the father sent the son into the world to completely revolutionize the world. And I can just I just I just take so much joy in studying Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus will say uh, eventually that he left his words with the apostles so that there they might find joy. And, and every time I read Jesus, every time I read about Jesus, there's just this feeling in me that I get that is, is filled with joy. I can't really explain it. it. It does two things. It makes me happy. It makes me joyful. But then on the other side, it leaves me wanting more of Jesus Christ. Almost as to say, there's a, a, a level of, of, of authentication that we sometimes miss and we sometimes take for granted and it just leaves us hungry for more. So he says in verse number three of chapter 17, this is the way to have eternal life to know you, the only true God, and, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. He says, this is how we uh, uh, get that eternal life. In fact, this is life eternal, to know God and the one whom he has sent, and that is Jesus Christ. So we find this sort of language, and we see that Jesus is embodying this effort, right? That, that Jesus is so 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 dedicated to revealing the father because he knows that the revelation of the father the the complete exposure of the father and the glory of the father it it it, it yields dividends in the earth in fact it is jesus's way of saying this is what the earth really needs to know the father to to see him to understand him to to be in close proximity to him not that he is far off but that in his desire to grow closer to humanity and essentially the world, the world seems to want to draw away from him and go further away from him, even though he is anticipating the, 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 the day in which 
we can come into full reconciliation. And Jesus sees it as his job, his duty to do this work. All right. Now, how God does that, how he perpetuates that is what this this chapter informs us of. In fact, many people debate whether or not Jesus saw himself as being the universal and timeless uh, influence that he has become the revolutionary, the the master and Lord that he has become over not just the first century or the circle of believers that would have occupied the time and space of his literal ministry, but the global and the universal and timeless uh, 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 phenomena that has now become known as Christianity. Many people debate whether or not Jesus intended that to be so, but we can positively know that through this prayer, Jesus desired for the entire world to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God and that this would be defined by the truth that he left with certain individuals. And we see that by the prayer, uh, the verses that includes this prayer in verse number six and following. He says, I reveal, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from the world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. So the way Jesus sees this thing working out is that he came into the world and he deposited into certain individuals everything that the Father gave him. And by that deposit, by that infusion, by that departation, uh, or should we say impartation, we find that they now have everything they need in order for the world to now move in the right direction. All right. Now, it is important for us to understand that this is not talking about us yet. But the beauty of this is that by taking this first step in the ministry of Jesus Christ, we now see how the perpetuation by how the continuance of the Christ work, uh, or should we say the Christo Christological work, it is now initiated. All right. It starts with a few men and it will now grow into this dynamic kingdom, this dynamic uh, universal manifestation. It's exactly the way Jesus taught about the kingdom, that the kingdom actually is birthed not in an instance. It does not come in a moment, but it starts and it flourishes into this great big tree. That's why the mustard seed is so phenomenal because the essence of the mustard seed is not that it is a regular seed and the fact that it produces fruit, but that that small seed becomes a great tree. All right. So we see this happening in this particular chapter. And because of this, because of what God intended to do through these uh, these these disciples, we see in verse number nine that the Lord says, I'm not praying that they would leave the world, but rather I want them to stay in the world, says he in verse number 11. He says, I'm going from the world. He says, but they are staying in this world and I am coming to you. Now, I want you to think about something. Here they are as the apostles sitting there, the disciples, if you will, sitting there. And the Lord says, now I'm going away. And of course, as we read in chapter, as we have read in chapter 14, they were troubled by this. And out of all of that misery, out of all that pain of knowing that their master, the one they have come to trust and love and put their faith in, is now disappearing. Jesus says, no, I'm not going to take them where I am, even though that is ultimately the goal. Before they get to where I am, they must stay where they are and they must finish what they have been tasked to do. Here's the here's the parallel. Jesus was sent into the world to do something so that he might receive honor and glory. And the task of the believer that will follow after Jesus Christ is that they must stay in the world so that ultimately they would get honor and glory as well. But what I want us to see here is that imagine being the apostles and wanting that moment where they can just be with Jesus forever and they can be in the same place where Jesus is so that business could continue as usual. But here there is a unique interruption to the fellowship and the things that they have experienced for virtually three years. And now they have to walk down the road 
of, 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 of their assignment. Walk down the road where they will complete their assignment. And here's a point that I want to bring out from this text. That sometimes, brothers and sisters, God does not remove you from situations because in that situation is where your assignment lies. All right. I was just praying this prayer all last night and praying and thinking about it all yesterday and asking the Lord, you know, Lord, you've put certain things on my heart that I want to do. And it just seems as if I don't have the ability to do those things. Well, here we find that it is in those moments and in those times where we feel like we have no other resource except God, that that is the place where God wants us to fulfill our assignment. Imagine being the apostles. They didn't have the luxuries of some of the most uh, successful individuals in their society or some of the uh, dominant uh, leaders in their society. They didn't have their access to some of the uh, privileges that the Pharisees and the scribes and and the chief priests had in the form of Roman uh, 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 affiliation. None of that was at their uh, disposal. But what they did have, brothers and sisters, is truth. Jesus left them with something. He left them with his words, brothers and sisters. And if the word of Jesus was found in them, Jesus was telling them they had everything that they needed. OK, so because of that, Jesus says, I'm going to leave them in that mess that they're in. I'm going to leave them in that dark world because now that I'm leaving, the world will become dark. But I have left light in a dark world. All right. That situation that you're in, you are light in that dark situation. You might have been praying for the Lord to take you out of it, but Jesus is praying for you to stay in it. <laughs> Jesus never intended for you to leave it. He intended for you to change it. And brothers and sisters, I, I bring this point to you because we are in a moment where not not a moment where the world is ending. We're in a moment where the world is changing. And one of the things that God does when he changes the world is he leaves his people in the midst of the change so that people can expose the father to the world so that they can know who God is and the one he has sent. That is Jesus Christ. All right. Can I can I just offer this to you? Some of us have been praying our way out of certain things that we'll never get out of. Because Jesus has prayed that we stay in it because his intention was so that we would shine bright and the world will come to know who the father really is. All right. I know that that doesn't make us shout or make us happy in many instances, but you should take pleasure in knowing. <laughs> and that's easier said than done. Obviously, you should take pleasure in knowing that some things you are being placed in so that God can be glorified. Notice what he says here in verse number 13. I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you, notice here, he says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. But what I'm asking you to do, brothers and sisters, look at what he says, to keep them safe from the evil one. Now, God may not take us out of it, but he'll keep us safe while we're in it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Isn't that beautiful, brothers and sisters? So here it is, brothers and sisters. Maybe we should stop praying for deliverance. That is rescue out of the problem. And maybe we should start praying for safety in the problem. <laughs> maybe the world and the confinement in the context that the Lord has allowed us to be a part of. Maybe we will never leave it. But maybe the prayer that we should be praying, if we want to pray in the will of the Lord, is that God will keep us safe in the predicament that he has left us in. OK, I want you to think about how the apostles would have been thinking about this. You know, the apostles had the ability to pray and, 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 and rejoice in difficult situations. They would be in a, a terrible situation and they would be rejoicing. We read of stories where the apostles were in jail 
and they would be thanking God and singing hymns of praises. We read of te testimonies where the apostles would be beaten and ran out of town and they would be saying things like, I can be content in all things. I know how to be full. I know how to be hungry. I know how to be uh, without. I know how to be with. We find this abnormal ability to remain consistent in adverse situations. And that's because they understood something that no matter what happens around us, there's nothing that anyone can do to us as long as we are doing the will of the Lord. For some of us, we may never see a jail cell, but what we will see is hostility in the plans that God has for our lives. For some of us, we will never be ran out of town and beaten, but for some of us, we find it very difficult to do that thing that the Lord has called us to do. We find ourselves limited. We say to ourselves, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work out. You're telling me to do something that is impossible. I don't know how I'm going to start this business. I don't know how I'm going to write this book. I don't know how I'm going to finish this song. I don't know how I'm going to communicate this to this individual or these people. We find ourselves limited. And here's the thing that you have to begin to convince yourself of. And I should I say, begin to believe. You've got what it takes. Whoever said that you needed all of the other stuff, that is your idea. The truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus is showing the apostles here. He is showing them you have everything you need. You have my word. Now spread it. Declare it. Speak it. Share it with everybody that you come in contact with. Because by doing that, you are putting yourself in a position of safety. Well, he says in verse number 18, just as you sent me into the world, and we know what dangers Jesus faced, he says, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Now, this is where we come into the picture. I love this verse. I love this chapter, but I love this verse in this chapter because I felt I felt left out. You know, many people will say, well, that's for them and it ain't for got anything to do with us. And contextually, you may have a point. But here the text says in verse number 20, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Brothers and sisters, before you were even born, Jesus prayed for you. He prayed that you would have what it takes. And I'm just going to say this. If Jesus prayed for this, brothers and sisters, I have no reason to think that God didn't hear his prayer. I have no reason to think that the father did not honor the prayers of Jesus, his son. I have every right to believe <laughs> that Jesus's prayers were heard by the father and they were granted. Notice what he says. He says, I pray that they will all be what? One, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Here's a point I want to bring to you. Your success will be determined by how dedicated you are to helping somebody else believe, okay? Now, brothers and sisters, we have to think differently. We cannot think like the world thinks. See, the world's idea of success is, is measured monetarily, materially, uh, socially even. It is a sort of selfish success. But I want you to understand that Jesus is it's setting forth here an idea that that if we grab hold of it, we will find the success that we're looking for. And if you're a believer, the, the success that you're looking for is the kind that God wants you to have. That's where your mind is. Your mind is now devoted to the things of God, just like Jesus was, which is why Jesus could come into the world and see all that the world has to offer and look at it and say no. Did he have a right to it? Absolutely. Could he have gotten it? Most definitely. But he looked at it and said, I want no part of it. I'm here to do what the Father sent me to do. When your mind is set on that, you will find every bit of the success you're looking for. But you have to have the intention of making Jesus known. 
Now, the amazing thing about all of this is that Jesus gives us all unique ways of doing that. For some, it will be writing a book. For some, it will be singing a song. For some, it will be getting out in the community and, and, and making your impact through acts of service. For others, it's raising funding for the different projects of the Lord to go on and operate. It's various ways in which we do that. But ultimately, brothers and sisters, our idea must be, I got to make Jesus known so that somebody can come and believe that he is who he said he is. Can I say this to you? Jesus is not, and I'm going to say this with all the respect that I possibly can. Jesus is not who you heard preached in church. I, I know that may startle you, but the truth is there has been a huge distortion of who he really is. Just like there would be one in this time. There was a huge distortion of who God was, what he did, how he operated and how he maneuvered and how he involved himself in the creation. So just as it was back then is the same here. We have a huge misunderstanding of who Jesus is and who the Father is and what they want from us. And the task of every believer is to clarify who the Father is, introduce who the Son really is, and convince people why they should believe. That happens all different shapes, forms, and fashions. But the, but the important thing is that we get on board. So I want to challenge everybody today. I want to challenge every person that will listen to this video to get on board and realize you got what it takes as long as the word of Jesus is in you. Now, if you're questioning that, that's OK. It's no problem there. But it now becomes your responsibility to get the word in you. Make it your endeavor. Make it your every, every, every responsibility, or should we say your greatest devotion to get that word in you. And that takes effort on your part and a willingness to meet Jesus for yourself. Now, there are ways we can help you do that. That's why I'm here. That's why we have different uh, organizations and, and different things in, in the world that the Lord has saw fit to allow to be here so that we can do that. But don't sit on the sideline. Get in the game. All right. And know you got what it takes. Many of us are listening to or are watching the documentary on Michael Jordan. And as a LeBron James fan, one of the things that I'm realizing is that Michael Jordan was a special individual simply because he never allowed anybody to tell him he does not have what it takes. He was able to convince himself that I have everything I need to be the greatest basketball player that this world has ever seen. And I want you to know that you have everything you need in order to be a faithful servant in the kingdom of God. You just got to get in the game. Get in the game, brothers and sisters. Let's not lay to the side anymore and watch the world do whatever it wants to do. Let's get into the game because the Lord has left us here for a reason. And until that day comes where we can say it's all over, God has allowed us to finish our course, we got some work to do, all right? And that's where you find your greatest peace, happiness, and success. So brothers and sisters, I'm in the game. Maybe I should have titled this, Get in the Game. But for whatever it's worth, let's just do our part and let's continue to do what the Lord wants us to do. I thank God for you. I hope you have a magnificent and a wonderful week and I hope you find the peace of the Lord in every day that you are allowed to partake in. Until next time, thank you for watching and God bless.